Um, <clears throat> before we get into our passage this morning, just kind of one FYI, uh, just for us as a body, I uh, want to let you know that the bridal room, which is over here, see, see I'm still learning, it's getting a little transformation. Uh, and so just because, because of its size, and so when there are bridal parties, and so it, it doesn't hold uh, everything that needs to be done in there. So we were thinking, how do we go through this? And so just through some different things going on, we are kind of transforming that room into kind of a hospitality hub for our Sunday mornings. Uh, so there's different things that are going to be taking place in there. Uh, there's going to be kind of helping the coffee team and so getting some water and things in there so it'll be kind of based in there and just some other things that will help us be hospitable to those that are here and joining us on Sunday mornings. So if, if you see some things happening over time, that's, it's not a fast, we're not moving at breakneck speed to make that take place, but just to let you know what's going on there. And so we feel it's good to let people know uh, what's going on with the building and how we're using it for his glory and his honor. Um, <clears throat> I have mentioned before uh, about my brother's story. Uh, and my brother who had Guillain-Barre syndrome, or we uh, a lot of times talked about it as GBS just because it's hard to say, or people say it three or four different ways. Uh, but I was, uh, recently my mom had these created and given to us in the family. Uh, and so this is, it says, Justin's journey with GBS. Uh, and so what is in this book is we have a few different things. One, we have, uh, we had a caring bridge. So all of the posts that were made in the caring bridge, all of the comments that were made uh, by various people, and there were people from all over the place, from my home church at the time, from my brother's home church at the time in West Virginia, from my parents' church, from my brother's home church uh, that was going through GBS and friends kind of all over the U.S. and some across the world. Um, and so we have all of that recorded, and we have the family text chain while all of this is going on. Uh, and so it put all together to kind of serve as a memory for us of, of what went on and... The reason I bring that up is because there is a lot of emotion that's tied to that. And even this morning, reading through some of it, I had to put it down because I was like, I can't do this right now, uh, going through that. But a significant thing at that time is we were all wondering, why? What's going on? Why? And so Guillain Barre is, is fairly significant, and, and it's where his muscles were shutting down or going to sleep. That becomes a problem when it comes to muscles like the diaphragm and others that help you survive. So he was on life support, and only due to medical advancement at this time is he still uh, alive with us today. And he has recovered since this time, and if you were to look at him, you wouldn't know it. And so that is a huge blessing but again, it came back to us asking God many times through this process, why? What's going on? What is God doing? To be honest, this was a difficult time for me, a time where I was wrestling often and just saying, God, what are you trying to teach us? Because a former senior pastor and my father had drilled into me just saying, Let's not get caught up on problems outside of this, but let's look and say, when there's hard times, what is God teaching us? So it was difficult. There was a lot of times where we're saying, and, and I was personally saying, God, if you're trying to teach me something through this happening to my brother, could you help me learn it quick so we could go beyond this? We had talked about that as family multiple times, just saying, we don't know what God's doing, but we wish it would happen quickly. It was hard because we needed to trust God's timing. This request for us to learn things quickly did not accelerate the time frame. Now, I've grown up in a family where my, my dad was a pastor since before I was born. 
the gospel was always present in our home. I went to Christian school up through my elementary and middle school years, so I had that. So the Bible was very present there. Uh, I got my undergrad at Cedarville, and so I was a Bible major, so I had Bible all throughout there. I went to Southern Seminary for my Master of Divinity, and so and it's, you're studying the Bible very deeply there. And so, and all of that took place before this. So there's a lot of times where I think I had a lot of knowledge of what a relationship with God is like, what it's supposed to be, but there's just something different. When you are forced to walk that road and have a very unique and special relationship with the Lord, when you are forced to trust on him daily. It goes beyond knowledge of who God is. And so this was an experience for me that was exactly that, getting to know God differently, trusting God's timing. That's hard. We want to accelerate things. If we think about us in general, when we go through hard things, we want to solve it right away. We want it to be done. We want to move on, learn what I need to learn. Get it taken care of and go. It's hard to trust God's timing. What we're going to see in Nehemiah chapter 2 today is we're going to look at Nehemiah and trusting God's timing. What does that look like? What did he have to do? I'm sure he hoped Jerusalem would have been put back in order After the first return of the exiles, as they worked on the temple, let's do the city walls as well to make sure people are protected and there is no shame with the people. Instead, he too had to wait on God's timing. So we're going to see a lot of that this morning as we focus mostly on that first section of the chapter and kind of do a high overview, uh, just kind of review of the second half of the chapter. But let's look at Nehemiah chapter 2. Now, I would encourage you uh, to stand with me for the reading of God's Word if you are able. Uh, this is going to be a little bit longer of a chapter, and so, but we can make it. We can do it. We're going to see in a little bit that they read for hours standing, listening to God's words later on in the book of Nehemiah. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says this, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its great gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sambalet the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant Heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and I had a few men with me. 
And I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate and the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words of the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, and Tobiah the Ammonite servant, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, They jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. You may be seated. Let's pray that God would open our eyes and our hearts to this passage this morning. Dear God, we are thankful that we get to study your word together. You have chosen for a purpose to give us each and every one of the books that makes up your word, the Bible. Thank you for that, and I ask that you would give us wisdom this morning that you would open our hearts to the truth of your word and that we would examine our hearts and say, how does my heart line up to what we hear in your word today? We pray that through the study of your words that you would get glory and honor this morning. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name, amen. As we look at this passage kind of an initial run-through, an initial read-through that we just did, it may seem fairly straightforward. We see Nehemiah has an interaction with the king coming after chapter 1 where he had this burden for Jerusalem and its walls. And then he comes to the king and makes a request. After the king grants that request, then they take a trip and go to Jerusalem. Then he inspects the walls, inspects what's going on, and says, where are we? What do we need to be doing to fix these walls? And then gets the people on board, those that are to do the bulk of the work. So those are kind of the main two scenes that we see in this chapter. That breaks up our uh, kind of study this morning, and, and as I mentioned, we're going to study, look a little bit more deeply into that first scene, his interaction with the king, and then we're going to kind of do a high-level review of the rest of that chapter, looking at his travel and time in Jerusalem and discussion with the people. Now, I would encourage you, if, if you have been, to be reading through ahead of time studying the chapter, and the little Nehemiah kind of reading guide that's here, what we're going to notice is that especially the observation questions are significant in this chapter. So we have the questions such as learning about the main characters in this section. We see multiple main characters being added to the, the story, the narrative, this week. We see also time and place. We talked about the month last week where it says these months. Why does it mention those? It tells us certain things about the passage. We see also place. Now, you'll notice the first time Nehemiah mentions Jerusalem by name 
is when he's already almost in Jerusalem. Why doesn't he mention that city to the king? He talks about his homeland, where his forefathers are from, but never once mentions, at least recorded, Jerusalem to the king. There's significance there. Is there conflict or a high point? Yes, we see these detractors coming. These two individuals, then they add a third at the very end, giving this conflict and saying, hey, let's remember what happened the last time this, this tried to happen. And so what you stopped, the king came back and got you, is their main theme or main point. Hopefully we'll be hitting on some of those main themes this morning. And then surprises. Man, you look at the very first half of that chapter, you think everything's going according to plan. Everything's going smooth. Everything's going easy. He has this time with the king, and the king's like, yes, 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 yes. But then you have these adversaries when they get to Jerusalem. Nehemiah's reminded, this isn't going to be easy. So just encourage you again, be reading through that. There are a few more of those scripture journals available. Uh, be reading, preparing as we come to the, to the chapter that we're going to be studying today. So with the theme, main theme of trusting God's timing, let's look into the first part of our passage today. The first part that we see, and this is going to be a very simple PowerPoint this morning. First part is Nehemiah with the king. And so we have Nehemiah with the king, and verses 1 through 3 show us that in his time with the king, there's a little distress that he is under. So we see that it's, it impacts his countenance. We understand that this stress comes from chapter 1. He gets report from his brother and says, hey, how is Jerusalem looking? And he says, man, we are, it's, it's a shameful experience. It's burned. The gates are down. The walls are down. There's no protection. And so he's distressed and saying, this is God's holy city. This is where my family is in this area. So there's distress as he says, I want this to be rebuilt. Nehemiah puts this matter to prayer before asking the king anything. And he specifically asks God that he would give him mercy and success. Mercy, success. So as I mentioned before, verse 1 of chapter 2, we see a main character added to the narrative, King Artaxerxes. Many believe that Artaxerxes, who is the son of King Xerxes, is the stepson of Queen Esther. So this thinking is that Xerxes, another name for him is King Ahasuerus that we read about in the book of Esther. And there's a couple different connections that they make when they make that argument. But this helps us identify and understand why in the world is Nehemiah, a Jew, in such a prominent place in this Medo-Persian empire? Queen Esther, Mordecai, had great influence on the nation and on the king. And so there was these Jews that were brought up, and we even see Daniel and his three friends. There are different times where God raises up Jews to be a part of a foreign nation for his work. And so we see the influence of Esther and Mordecai on the Medo-Persian Empire would have been significant. In this particular instance, we see the text mention that there's wine before the king. Now, we may be thinking, now, why is this important to mention? Why is this significant? Just at the end of chapter 1, we see uh, Nehemiah mentions, I'm cupbearer to the king. It seems like weird details to mention. But the significance here is that this is a time where Nehemiah would have face time with the king. He would have been in front of him. He's preparing for whether it be a festival, a religious celebration, uh, some other gathering and, and celebration that they would have had. Nehemiah would have been preparing for this, preparing for this time to take place before the king, and he was responsible to make sure things happened well, and especially the wine was brought before the king. So we see the details are mentioned to tell us 
This is a time Nehemiah knew he was going to have a presence before the king. We don't know how often. The text doesn't mention how often he's there, but it's very specific in saying this is a special occasion where Nehemiah would have been before the king. There was this party, and Nehemiah as cupbearer had a very significant role in that. Now, if it were me, and I'm thinking about, hey, there's a problem that I know of. I've been praying about it for four months. I'm going to be very well prepared. If I'm coming to stand before a man that has power to do something about my problem and my country's problem. So I would have been best dressed. I would have been well rehearsed and and things that I could talk to the king about and maybe have some inroads to say, hey, king, could you help me out with this? That's not what Nehemiah did. We almost see the opposite. As it says, he came in sad. It's almost like he had that long face. He said, I've never come before the king in this way. The king notices this. He asks Nehemiah. And he's pretty observant as he goes and talks to Nehemiah. He says, now, why are you like this? You're not sick. So this only could be sadness of the heart. So he's observant. He's caring about Nehemiah as one of his significant servants to him. And he asks him these questions. Now, if this were true and you're like, man, the king really cares about Nehemiah, he, he's going to be talking to him, you would think Nehemiah is good. But it says he is very afraid. Very afraid to the point that before he asks the king anything, he says, I need to pray before God. You know, you, whenever you have those little situations where you're like, oh, this, someone asked me a question, you're like, I don't know how to answer that. Or something comes up and they're hurting and you're like, I don't know how to respond to this. And you're like, God, please help me. God, please help me. It's almost what I see Nehemiah doing where he's saying, this is the moment. God, please help me. Give me the words to say. Give me the actions to do. But we first want to look and say, why would Nehemiah have been afraid? Why would he have been fearful? Things seem to be going his way. There are very significant reasons why Nehemiah would have been afraid. First is practical. His role is to help facilitate this festival or celebration. So he's supposed to be one of the key players to make sure that it is good. Make sure things happen as they should. And he comes in and the king is almost like, Nehemiah, why are you killing the mood? Why are you coming in with that long face? This is a celebration. It is something good. It also reminds me of when you go to a little kid's birthday party and they have siblings. You already know where I'm going with this. They have siblings and all the presence and attention is on one child. And then you have the brother or sister over here just throwing a fit because they don't understand. We're supposed to, we are celebrating this individual. We aren't celebrating everyone for the sake of just celebrating And you're like, stop ruining things. Stop whining. Let's be happy for our brother or sister. So that's that first fear is this could be significant. If you remember, in the book of Esther, when the king brought his wife and said, hey, I want you to dance for me and my nobles. She's like, no, I'm not doing that. Immediately. Right then, the nobles came to him and said, yeah, this can't happen. You can't have people disobeying the king. His wife, the queen, lost her role. That moment. So we see the king has the power, whether it be his wife, whether it be one of his primary servants in a celebration, if he is not liking the way you're responding in this festival, that could be your life. So that's the first thing. He's where he's saying, I'm putting my life out there. I think I'm doing the right thing. I want to be following the Lord. I've been praying and he's been leading up to this situation. And I could still lose my life by doing what I think is right. Second, and almost more importantly, Nehemiah knew that the request he was about to make was in 
direct opposition to a decision that King Artaxerxes had made earlier in his life. Let's look at this for a second. Let's go back, just turn a few pages ahead. I was going to put this on the screen, but it's, it would have been way too many screens. So if you just turn back to Ezra chapter 4, uh, I'd like to read a little section to kind of help us get a little understanding of the context of this and the significance of what Nehemiah is asking here. So in Ezra chapter 4, starting in verse 17, listen to this and follow along. It says this, uh, and context for this. King Artaxerxes is responding here to a letter that was brought to him when the walls in the city were being rebuilt during one of the earlier exile returns. They worked on the temple, they're getting that done, and they're working on the city also, and there's some people that write the king, and they say, hey, what's going on here? These rebels are going to do this, and they are going to turn away from you if this city is completed. This is King Artaxerxes' response, starting in chapter 4, verse 17. The king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their associates who lived in Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river. We've seen that province beyond the river multiple times in our passage and he says, greeting, and now the letter that you sent to us has been plainly read before me, and I make a decree, and search has been made, and it has been found that the city from of old has risen against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made in it. And the mighty kings have been over Jerusalem, mentioned specifically, who ruled over the whole province beyond the river, to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Therefore, make a decree that these men be made to cease, and that this city be not rebuilt until a decree is made by me. And take care not to be slack in this matter. Should damage, why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? We can go back to our passage in Nehemiah, but you get a glimpse. That's significant. He's saying these are rebels that come out of Jerusalem. Yes, they have have gone against us. Why should hurt be brought to the king? And he's saying, stop it. And he's saying, don't be slow about it. Stop this immediately. Don't let them work another day. Don't be slack on this. This is the same king Nehemiah is going to make a request to and say, hey, you know that thing that you said not to do? I'm going to ask you if we can do it. Why do you think he was afraid? The king was fairly clear. Do not let this happen. And now he's going to make a request. What do we see with this? We see before it was not God's timing that the city be rebuilt. Nehemiah is wondering at this point, is this the timing? Is this when it's supposed to happen? God, are you going to use me in this process? He's putting his life on the line and saying, I'm trusting in God's timing. I know it wasn't then. This is the same king. Is this going to happen now? That's significant, putting his life on the line for something the king was against earlier. Nehemiah is looking to the king, looking at his responses and saying, are you responding favorably to me now? Is God directing this interaction that we're having? We almost see this little communication between Nehemiah and the king. Is Nehemiah testing the water? You see, first he kind of comes in with this long face. How's the king going to respond? Is the king going to say, get over yourself, Nehemiah, this is a celebration. You do that or you're out. No, he, was, he responded positively saying, what's going on? Sadness of heart. Is this king going to ask questions about this? And we see that's exactly what happens. The sequence led to his request. His request 
was the next thing we're going to be looking at with Nehemiah's request. But even in the request says, is the king going to have compassion when the request is given? I mean, you look at, at that part of the passage where he says in verse 4, the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. He said, God, please help me. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah. It, he doesn't say Jerusalem. Send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves. He's not wanting to like bring any bells to say, oh, the rebel city? No, but he's, he's saying These are, this city is important, and it is in Judah. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone, and when you re will you return? Essentially saying, yes. And he gives this other question, how long are you going to be gone? When are you going to come back? I appreciate and I enjoy your service. I'm not just releasing you forever. I want you back. Nehemiah responds by saying, so it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. He's testing the waters, seeing things moving positively. Then we see a little transformation in Nehemiah. We see a transformation where he's not waiting on the king to ask him any questions any longer. Instead, he says, hey, I've, I've got a couple other requests. There are a few things that I would like, if it pleases you still. Could you give me letters? Letters of protection. So that all the provinces that I go through that are under your rule, they will know I am on a king's official job. You've signed off on this. You've given permission. You've granted me the ability to do this. Not only that, but could you also give uh, a letter to your, the guy that has all your building materials? And I need enough building materials for this, 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 and this. He's got a list that he's bringing out. And everything is granted. That doesn't just happen normally. That's God at work. You see, he even mentions that. At the very end, it says, for the hand, the good hand of my God was upon me. So he made his request, asked for these things. We see that Nehemiah, through his request, he wasn't passive. He wasn't saying, all right, it wasn't good then. We're just going to sit around and wait till God fixes it. Rather, he prayed for four months. He had a passion for this, and he said, God, I, this is a burden on me. He was prepared when that time came that he could stand before the king. Again, all of this comes back to trusting God to restore he knew things were broken. He was prepared. He said, God, use me in this. He wasn't passive. Nehemiah saw that he had mercy in the sight of the king and his action. So we asked for this permission. Can I go rebuild these things? Nehemiah was actively waiting for God to move. When he saw God moving in the heart of the king, he said, God, you're opening the doors. I'm going to walk through and actively participate here. We're going to look at some application in a little bit, but I do want to give an overview of uh, the second part, and that's Nehemiah inspects the walls. We aren't given much information about the actual trip, so it looks like the letters that he was given were successful. He was able to give them show people, and he even showed the people as they, he came into this land and said, hey, I'm on a, a mission for the king. <clears throat> we are introduced to a couple new characters in this second half. The second half, and they're not friendly to Nehemiah. They are probably liking the way things are. They're probably some rulers of some level. Uh, in this territory, so they're probably receiving these documents, and they're like, oh, great, it's happening again. Someone's coming back, they're receiving permission from the king to rebuild the city walls, and they're not happy about it. 
things are going well as they are for them. And they don't want this people who are known to be rebels in the past to be rebuilding these walls again. So we're introduced to these two new characters. These characters are going to show up a few more times. They're not going to let things go. They're going to be that thorn in Nehemiah's flesh, and this is the very first time that we see them. We also see a, kind of a main section, and we may be wondering, why is he doing it this way? Is he inspects the walls by night. We almost see this idea of him inspecting the walls. A main theme with this is caution. Caution. He's, he's being cautious as he goes through this, you, we've already been introduced to these people that are not favorable to his mission. So if he does this in broad daylight, there's a very good chance some of the people that are in the city or in this area of Judea are going to tell these two individuals. It's going to be significant, so he's going to have major pushback before he even tells the people what's going on. So he said, I'm going to do this secretively. I'm going to do this in a way where no one else sees it. There's only going to be one animal, and it's the one that I'm on. He's got his little group, and he inspects everything by night, trying to be quiet, trying to do things that are not noticed and not seen, because he knows enemies are close. Things could be very difficult, so he inspects this by night. While he's inspecting, he still hasn't told anyone what he's there for. Now, he's got this letter to say, hey, they can come, and, and he's going to be doing some, uh, some things on behalf of the Jewish people, but apparently it's not spelled out very clearly because it says multiple times he's keeping this information to himself, holding it back a little bit, waiting for the right time to tell people. It's as if he has a plan. He has the materials for the plan. He has permission for the plan. Now he's inspecting to say, is this going to fit my plan? Do we need to make some adjustments as I look to see where Jerusalem is? Again, he's very active in this. It wasn't until after he completed this inspection that he gathers the people around. And he says, this is what's going on. I am here to rebuild the walls. I'm here to lead and guide in this. And he's calling on the people, do this with me. What's interesting through this is that he mentions, I've had good favor from the king. This is what he's told us. We're able to do this. And even more so, he says, God's hand has been moving. So the two areas of authority that would have been able to have some impact on this, one being God, the most important one, he says, God's moving this direction. I'm calling on you, join with me. And that other second authority says, the king's given us the green light. Let's do this. The people respond saying, let us rise up and build. They say, we're in Let's do this. They respond positively. Everyone's moving the right direction. Everyone's on board, excited. And that's when we have the opposition come in. Sanballat and Tobiah come back to the scene. They know now the intentions of Nehemiah. They know what he's doing. They knew he came for the good of the people, but now they know he's rebuilding the city. How could he? So they come, they taunt, they try to scare. They know this has happened before. They're trying to taunt and scare and say, it's just a matter of time. It's going to be shut down again. You're rebels. Why are you doing this? Are you going to rebel yet again against this king? Nehemiah's response was unique because it doesn't even mention the king. He doesn't respond and say, oh, the king gave us permission. He knows they saw the letters. But rather, he talks of a higher authority when he says, the God of heaven will make us prosper. He's telling them, this is God's timing. We've had brokenness for a while. We've known its need restored. Now is God's timing. It wasn't before, but it is now. He is trusting that God will continue to protect 
and grant success to their plan. That's chapter two. So what do we as hearers of this narrative record in the Bible a long time ago? What do we learn from this? What do we gather from this? First, we need to trust God's timing. As a people who like resolution to our problems right now, we have to understand that our preferred timing may not be God's preferred timing. There may be things that we need to learn first. There may be things that our heart needs to be changed in certain areas before things ultimately will be resolved. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can't understand all of what God is thinking. We have to rely on his timing. We have to rely on his plan. Sometimes that doesn't go as fast as we would like it but we need to trust. I'm sure the Israelites themselves would have loved to have the city of Jerusalem being rebuilt back when Zerubbabel and the first group of the exiles returned to the land. That would have been great. Let's get it all done at one time. Let's fix this up. But that wasn't God's timing. They had to go through some hardship before they got there. Nehemiah had to go through four months of prayer before even the Lord was ready to have this, hit this particular interaction with the king. We may not understand why God does what he does, but we need to trust that his plan is good and best. In the midst of my brother's physical struggles, I asked a lot of questions because I didn't know why things were happening. Even now, I'm thinking I may go back and be like, God, couldn't you have done that in a different way? Couldn't you have accomplished what you wanted to accomplish without having so much pain? It's because I don't understand all that he does. But all I and all we need to do is look back at other parts of life and see that he is faithful. He is faithful. So even when we don't understand, God has a reputation of being faithful. We can trust in his timing. Second, trusting God's timing and waiting on God's timing does not mean just sitting around and being stagnant. When we see something's wrong, when we see something's broken, we should be active in some way towards that restoration, whether it's praying for it and saying, I don't physically know what I can do, I don't know what actions I can take, but God, this is a burden to me. That's what Nehemiah did. He wasn't stagnant, but he prayed, said, God, prepare me for this. We see that when Nehemiah saw God moving, he said, I'm ready. God, you've changed my heart. You've prepared me for this. I've got the questions to ask. I know know we need the materials. We see Nehemiah had an Isaiah 6, 8 attitude where we see Isaiah say, here I am, Lord, send me. Send me. I want to be a part of restoration. I don't want to sit around and just watch Use me in your plan. Do we have that same mentality that we desire to be used by God and will actively prepare ourselves to be involved in God's plan of restoration? That's not going to be pretty and it's not going to be easy going through that. We may be in a difficult time with various things that can be broken. A relationship, a career, a marriage, among many other things. We shouldn't just sit around and hope things get better or hope God's timing comes quickly. Spend that time in prayer. Allow it to change and mold our hearts to be aligned. Have our hearts be aligned with what God's heart is for the situation. And how do we know God's heart? That's through his words. 
praying, knowing what God wants, digging into his words. Those are ways that we can be active, ready for God to use us. Digging into God's words so we know what he expects in a marriage, in a work ethic, in a friend, in a church member, in a citizen, parent, child, or whatever role we have. Again, this transforms our hearts and minds to the will of God for our lives. Don't sit around, but get involved. This isn't even an attempt to rush God's timing. It's making sure that our hearts are ready when God's timing comes, when his timing is ready. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the example in Nehemiah, putting his life on the line because his passions are your passions. His heart desired what your heart wanted. His heart cared about your name. God, we pray that we would have the same heart. That when we see something in this world that is broken, we would have a heart and a passion that reflects your desires. Lord, that we just wouldn't have a passion about it either, but that that would drive us to action. Praying for the situation, knowing your will in a situation, asking you, how can I be involved in this situation. God, on the other end, I pray that we would be patient. Understanding and realizing that there are times that we still need to learn something before something's going to be resolved, before it's your timing for it to be fixed. Help us to have open hearts, to know and understand and to be seeking how can we learn what you are trying to teach us? So often we are focused on our health, what's good for us, things going well for us, and that can cloud our vision to be seeing what do you want for us? What do you want to teach us? How do we need to know you better? God, we love you. Help us to wait on your timing and to prepare ourselves for it. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may go in peace this morning.